tool post grinder for my Myford lathe, part two, making a special large T-nut to fit a Proxon bench mount to a Myford ML7 cross slide. I thought I would start this episode by showing this really good picture. It's actually a sort of a digital painting, and it was a birthday present from my eldest daughter, Emma. It is, of course, an image of me in the style of A Nightmare Before Christmas. And I really like it. I have it framed and I'm about to put it on the wall. This is a shot of the cross slide of my Myford ML7R lathe. And as you can see, the top part is the cross slide, but there are two spare slots on the table. And by way of an experiment, what I propose to do is mount one of my Proxon bench mounts on the cross slide table. And just to refresh your memory, here is a Proxon bench mount. This is the one on my bench, but I bought a second one. They're very simple devices and allow you to position the Proxon motor tools anywhere that you want, thanks to the ball and socket arrangement. I think these are excellent things to have in the workshop. You can either clamp them to the bench, as shown here, or if you look back at the other one, that's actually screwed to the bench. They are altogether a very useful thing to have in the workshop. Unfortunately, the holes in this unit are just slightly too wide to fit in the slot on the Myford ML7R. I need to make a special extra long T-nut, and if you don't know what a T-nut is, it's fairly self-explanatory. T-nuts are more frequently used for clamping things down onto milling machine tables or even onto cross slides like the one on this Myford. After making a mark on a piece of steel bar to correspond with the width of the Proxon bench mount, I cut the piece of steel to length using the larger of my two bandsaws. When I hold the piece of steel bar in place you can see that it's just slightly longer than the width of the cross slide. And that is why I cannot use a standard T-nut because it could actually damage the cross slide. In this clip Using my steel rule, I'm measuring the depth and width of the T-slots in the cross slide. The height of the T-nut at this stage is not important. The final sizing takes place much later in the operation. I'm going to be using my milling machine, first of all, to cut this piece of steel to be the exact width of the T-slot at the bottom. So it's over to the milling machine and I'm using a paintbrush to clean away any swarf that may affect the positioning of the piece of steel bar in the machine vise. I could use a larger milling cutter than the one shown here. By using this size of milling cutter means that I can take multiple passes, therefore showing how to do it because this is of course a tutorial. I marked a line on the piece of steel using a felt tip pen. This is the line I'm going to machine down to. Before I start the machining operation, I'm tapping the piece of steel into position using a soft hammer. This makes sure that it's sat firmly down on the packings. Let the cutting commence. This part of the video is running in real time. This is the speed at which I cut the piece of steel. I started off by cutting the piece of steel without any lubricant whatsoever. And these milling cutters weren't very expensive. I bought them as a set from RDG Tools and they really are good. To lubricate the milling cutter, I use some WD-40. Now, I know this is not ideal, cutting oil is much better, but it's very smelly and I don't think it's healthy. And while on the subject of health, it's probably not a good idea to squirt WD-40 directly up your nose. I've mentioned health because it's something that is on my mind at the moment. I made a video about prostate cancer for my Patreon supporters and normally the Patreon videos do not go public for at least three months. But owing to the subject matter in this case, I made the video public a couple of days later, on the 7th of May. I was quite surprised to find that almost immediately two of my Patreon supporters had cancelled their monthly subscription. There's something on Patreon that I can look at which is called Exit Surveys. When patrons leave Patreon, they can leave a parting note. Most people don't put anything, or maybe my financial situation changed, but occasionally I do get scathing comments, and I really don't mind that. The people who leave unpleasant comments when they leave Patreon think that they are doing this anonymously, and indeed they are, except I can figure out 
who's left which message and when, just by cross-referencing a couple of parameters in Patreon. Why am I telling you this? It's not important. But this comment that I'll show you in a moment was something else. I don't know what this pathetic troll was trying to achieve, but anyway, have a look on screen. This is what he wrote as he stopped paying me $5 a month to watch a video every day. I won't give his full name, but his first name is Ralph. And here on screen from the man called Ralph is the message that he left. He writes, I'm not interested in In the Hospital Prostate Problems Part 1 and all the other videos which doesn't have any connection to steam engines. But anyhow, all the videos are quite repetitive and doesn't contain too much new information. Sorry, that doesn't work for me. I'm not even going to reply to this man called Ralph because this comment is ignorance personified. Thankfully, the many sensible comments that I received about this video made it worthwhile making. While I've been telling you about this really stupid comment, I machined one side of the piece of steel, and now I've turned it round in the machine vice, and I'm machining the other side. Time for a top tip. When you machine parts that are going to fit into other parts, always machine them slightly oversized. That allows for a perfect fit once you've cleaned away all the tool marks. Generally speaking, for cleaning off tool marks, I use my belt sander because I'm quite good with it and surprisingly accurate, and that is all down to practice. Now comes the important part. I'm painting the piece of metal using some marking out blue. Once it had dried, I scribed a line exactly down the centre of the piece of bar. That allowed me to mark out two more lines either side of the centre line. Once this piece of bar is refitted into the milling machine's machine vise, I can cut up to the lines at both sides and to the correct depth. And as usual, using my methods, which are not particularly scientific or engineering-like, I held the piece of steel against the cross slide and using my deep hole marker, which has quite a fine point, I marked the depth of the T-slot onto the piece of bar. Back now to the milling machine, I added an extra piece of packing and tapped the bar into position with the soft hammer. A quick squirt of WD-40 and off we go. I have to mill down each side, all the way up to the line on the top and to the depth of the felt tip pen mark on the end. When side milling like this, it's really important to make sure that you always go in the direction of the cut, never against it. As you can see here, as I start the cut on the other side, I'm going from left to right. But there is a bit of a problem doing it this way. The machine is throwing very hot chippings directly at me. And to stop the pain, I've put a piece of gasket material in between me and the milling machine. Here I am not milling in the opposite direction, I've just wound the table back to start the next cut. This part of the video is running at 8 times normal speed, just to get through it without viewers slipping into a coma. Once I'd machined both sides of the T-nut to the correct size, I turned it over to machine the other side, tapping it with the hammer as usual. This is always a good idea to seat the part accurately in the machine vise. I left the dimension of this piece of steel top to bottom a little bit too long, so now I'm removing material from the underside which will drop the T-nut down in the slot. And by holding this part in the machine vise as shown, I ended up with a very accurate cut. After cleaning up the part on my belt sander, here you can see that it fits perfectly in the slot and it isn't slack at all. I'd like to mention at this stage that if I was making multiple individual T-nuts, I would still do it in the same way and machine a bar like this. Then I would mark it out, drill the holes to be threaded, and then simply just chop off each individual T-nut on the bandsaw. Then I would clean up the individual edges using my one-inch belt sander. Making your own T-nuts is a bit of a waste of time because they're very cheap to buy, but it's really good experience and good practice for accurate machining. What I'm about to do is mark the positions for the holes to be drilled and threaded to accept some M6 bolts, allowing me to fasten this unit to the T-slot. For this job, as you can see, I'm using my deep hole marker, 
a very useful tool. I didn't bother showing the threading operation, it was very straightforward. I drilled a couple of holes and tapped them M6, screwed the bolts all the way in, chopped them off on the bandsaw and then ground them flat. But before grinding them flat, I made sure that the bolts were really tight because I didn't ever want the eventuality of the bolts putting pressure on the bottom of the T-slot. Here I'm applying some oil to the T-slot in the table. All I have to do is slide this very long T-nut into position. And the other reason for making a very long T-nut is the actual finished position is further forward like this. Once I tightened the two M6 Allen cap head bolts, the entire unit was held very rigidly to the cross slide. And here you can see the principle. I found a scrap fitting that I made a few years ago, and this is ideal for testing the unit. It's made from aluminium, which is not ideal, but it will show how it works. There are one or two things that are not right here. The grinder is far too fine and this aluminium needs some lubrication. It's just picking up onto the grinding wheel. But it shows the principle and immediately I can think of a lot of uses for this. Here, for instance, is a flapper wheel. This two-post grinder won't get that much use. Most of the time it will be back in its bench form in the workshop down at the house. But there are times when a two-post grinder can be very useful indeed. And here's another application with a slot drill fitted in the drill chuck and drilling a hole through the piece of metal this way. And with an indexing attachment on the headstock, I suppose I could drill all the way round. As I have a rotary table on my milling machine, I think I'd probably use that. I'm going to try this tool post grinder in another video for cleaning up the outer edges of Chattermark flywheels. These are quite common on some of the models that I work on for customers. And by using a tool post grinder, it puts a lot less pressure on the component to clean up the outer edge. For safekeeping, I'm going to leave the large T-nut in the slot. And by gently tightening the bolts, it's locked in position so it won't vibrate loose. And that, my friends, concludes the two-part series about making a two-post grinder adapter for a Myford ML7R lathe in the workshop. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.